because I was thinking, let, let's imagine this is Sichuan. And Dirty Wall is the Sichuan, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. That is a car, no doubt. The DS is also a Sichuan, isn't it? And that is innovation. You can create different sorts of cars with an engine and, a, let's say, a body. So then it's innovation. The best example is the Italian version. In the 60s, they had a three-wheel car. You might have seen them. With the door opening in the front, yeah? I think you also move the steering wheel at the same time. Yeah. So three wheels and four wheels is an innovation. Is that okay? Yeah. Compared to petrol-driven and battery-driven, which is technology shift. Okay? So Tesla is a different technology compared to the Shiva. Yeah. Okay? The effect is the same. It reduces the cost of production. It is cheaper to buy it. So it's a gain for everybody if the technology is improving. But it can also be a gain with innovation. So I think if I ask you to come in your three wheel cars to pick me up 60 miles from here and drive very fast back to where we are planning to go, I would prepare a Tesla, if you ask me. I could accept a Deutsche War, but then I want at least some food driving till uh, the place we are planning to go to. Is it? Simply because it takes a lot of time. So I would more or less starve if I'm not getting food. But if I use a Tesla, I can use, yeah, let's say, three hours, and you will spend nine or ten hours doing this. So technology is reducing the cost of production. It is a gain for everybody. It's cheaper to buy. You can buy more of it. So if you export it, you can export more because it's cheaper. If you import it, you can import more because it's cheaper. So innovation and technology changes reduces the cost and increases uh, the potential for capital. <coughs> there is a tuna example in the US if you want an illustrative uh, like underlining of the waste of resources that actually is with license. Okay? Conventional measured costs are proven when you introduce a tariff. You, it is more costly to produce it with a tariff because you produce it at home instead of importing it. So there is no doubt that the cost is higher. Period. Two, there are other benefits from trade that not necessarily could be counted before the trade has been removed. So in addition to extra cost of, let's say, trade restriction, there might be benefits from extra trade as well. And it's hard to prove any form of trade regulation that has been proven beneficial, simply because it's so difficult to decide. There might be an optimal toll for large country. There are not many large countries, so there are not many optimal tolls. The other one is, there is no doubt that oil exporting countries like Brazil and Norway has gained from uh, taxing oil exports, simply because it's made more expensive, but those who need it has no alternative, so they have to pay. So if you wonder why Brazil and we are trying to extract more oil and gas, the answer is very simple. Thanks to OPEC that had a oil export tariff, we gain a lot of money from it. We earn more oil and gas revenue. There might be a term <coughs> Term of trade effects. 
but I'm afraid only in the theory. When it comes to practicing these regulations, it's hard to prove them. The first and major argument against free trade is simply there are what we call domestic market failures. So the domestic markets are not working optimally. So we need to look for what we call a second best solution. What is the alternative to second best is, of course, which is the market solution. But if the market is not functioning optimally, then we have a second best problem. Okay? You try to organize the market to gain what we call marginal social benefit. So there might be a marginal social benefit because the market is not functioning optimally. Okay? That is the idea. <coughs> it's shown in figure 10.3. This is a copy of 10.3. So if you don't recognize it, just sign the 10.3. Signed by the artist. Will be expensive in the future. Not as much as Mona Lisa, but very close. Yeah. So we are looking for a solution where we are regulating the market. The problem is internal. The problem is not with export and import. The problem is domestically. So it's inside the country. So why should we, let's say, start to regulate trade? Because trade is not creating the problem. The problem is here. It's not what we sell and buy to foreign. So why should we use selling and buying goods from importing or exporting countries? to solve a domestic problem. No, it is not, but it's easier to, let's say, find politicians that support it because it's hard for the consumers to see the effect of it. So what is the argument? It's simply this. There are a lot of politicians that can form a coalition and decide we regulate trade. So we blame it on trade. Who will pay for it is a million of consumers Try to organize a million demonstrators. Well, if you are in Kiev, maybe. But for the rest of the world, it's very hard to organize one million people to go and demonstrate against tariff on trade. Do you know any in Germany? Have you seen any rallies in Italy where they demonstrate, let's have more free trade? You can put it or translate it to French. But have you seen them? With big banners and say, more free trade to France, more free trade to Lorraine, or Alsace, or Provence. No, because there is so small gain for one individual. So why should I go into the street if this cost me, let's say, half a Norwegian beer? Because I need a half, not a half, I need a full bottle of beer. So why should I bother? I leave the bar before I'm drinking all anyhow. Why should I cook that? So the problem is no one has the strong interest to protest against it. But it's an easy way to get out of the problem for the politician. So that is the major reason. Did you meet Krugman last Friday? I know he was around, but probably not in Molda. He probably was in New York. So no one of you went to New York last Friday. Okay. But he, he would have told you, if you had asked him, in chapter 10, there are second best problems. How should we solve them? The answer is very simple. Use policy instruments that target the problem directly. So if the problem is domestic, use domestic policy instruments to solve it. 
don't mix it up with faith. And why do we do it? It's simply because no one protests. And when it comes to the next election, they have forgotten it. They would know it was something with free, but they forgot was it trade or was it something different. So what we can call non-visible cost, you cannot see them. You have to calculate them. It's hard to prove them, but they are obvious what we call non-visible cost. And since no one can point to it and say, this is what it will cost you with the tariff. And I think here's an example where you have $30 extra per year. How much extra do you pay every day? It's $30 per year. Eight cents? Nine cents? If I search in my pocket, I, I might find a ten cent. But it is so small value, so no one cares. So we call it non-visible cost. We cannot prove them. They are so small, but they are there. And how many are living in U.S.? Yeah, ten cents per is thirty million dollars. It's quite much money, isn't it? To per each is only less than ten cents. So they don't demonstrate for that. But there are probably correct second best solutions for the domestic problem. Why don't they look for it? It's simply because it's too complicated to come up with it. I think that is the major reason. It's complicated to come up with the right solution so they stick to the easy, which is correct trade. So that is the first answer to the problem. Politicians would look for an easy way out, and that is not domestic policy instrument. And then if I look at you, what is the problem with domestic policy instruments? It hurts somebody. And it's not one in Zimbabwe. It's one in your constituency. So next time they vote, and they look for majority, who won the last election? I lost it because of the domestic second best policy instrument here. Because it hurt it, somebody. So somebody could come at my rally and say, hey, you there, you took my job. But if this is a job lost in Brazil because we import less coffee, there will be no Brazilian on my rallies in Mulder where I am fighting for a political position. He might send a letter to a friend who is studying in Mulder, but who cares? They don't understand Brazilian in Norway. So the answer is it's easier to get away with trade regulation because domestic in policy instruments could hurt elections. So that is the second answer. It's not only complicated, but you can lose votes. And if you are a politician, there is one thing that counts enough voters. So if you lose a voter, that can be the margin of it shifted. And if you wonder how it works, contact David Cameron and ask, would you be happy if a Scotchman shifts from a yes to stay in the Union to a no? And I don't think you would say hallelujah, because now the Scots will leave us. No, they want them in. So that is the second problem. You want somebody to support you. They are voting. You can lose the competition. And then we are collective action. What is the collective action? As 
I say, have you been to Kiev last week? But did you plan to go there? What you could see in Kiev last week was collective action. Why did they collect on this independence play square in Kiev? Yeah? Against the president. It's one person, everybody has the same interest, they can be well organized. That's how it works when it is working. It's a well organized group with a very specific target to reach. And they all have the same interest, and they have a very strong interest in shifting. Okay? Uh, if you had gone to the southeast of Ukraine, would you have gathered as many in southeast as you did in northwest where Kiev is? Because they have different interests. So that is the other problem of collective action. There might be somebody who has very strong interest in this, but there are too few to make a rally. But the major problem is it's so small gain if they protest, so it's not worth the money. So it would be like you uh, wanting to buy, let's say, the textbook for 10 less Norwegian kroner. Would you rally around the bookshop for days and hours, night and day, to get it for 10 kroner less? No. So that is what it is about. The gain from the protesting or opposition is so small. I would rather see a very good French movie. I would rather go and have pizza in the center. I would rather go read the other textbook that I'm not start I've not started yet. So there are so many other interests. It's hard to organize what we call collective action. But have any of you taken part in the collective action? Never. I once did in 2011. I went to Oslo. And none of you know what happened in Oslo in 2011. It was in February. They were all using skis. It was the world championship in, in cross-country skiing. Nordic skiing. And the reason why we rallied was because there was a medal ceremony. So we had very strong interest in, in ski first. And then we rallied for it. So if you want somebody to rally, let's say, for more free trade, do it during the ski competition. Where there are a lot of Norwegian medals. And in the middle of the medal ceremony, you raise the banner and say, more free trade to Norway because then you have a possibility to be successful. So collective action simply means there has to be many who has to support your point of view or let's say uh, trying to struggle for the same target as you. It is very difficult as we show sooner or later. And it's a public good because it is, let's say, if somebody gets it, everybody would get it. So why should I rally if I can send you to do it for me? And if you win through and get the change of politics, I gain from it because it is, let's say, uh, fair for everybody. It's a public good. So if you need to have this changed, you need a rally. But those who has not, uh, has not been rallying with you, they gain from it because it's a public good. All of them gain from it. So it would be, for instance, I think one way to do this, let's imagine that we are in Barcelona or even in Sevilla. You know what it is? It's in Spain. Uh, we want somebody to support our free trade position. And we know that there is 30,000 free available flats in Sevilla. 
because no one can afford to use them. And they start the rally by saying, if you join into this rally, you will get a flat. You will have to occupy it, but we will, I say, uh, support you, stand around the flat and see to you that no one takes it from you. So if uh, you want somebody to rally for your free trade position in Spain, offer them a flat, because none of them have some place to live. So if the gain from it is very high, then it's much easier. Okay, none of you plan to go to Sevilla, and you don't have access to free flats in Sevilla. But if you want somebody to support your special position, that could be one way to do it, because then you will get a lot of support. Two, the reason why it's so easy for somebody to change trade policy is simply because they are small, they have a very big gain from it, and they are well organized. If this is Washington, you call it lobby groups or lobbyist groups. If this is Brussels, you call it lobbyist groups. So they are small, they are well organized, they have one agenda, one goal, and then it's much easier. But when we meet in Harare, we will discuss the success of the free trade movement in southern France in 2015, won't we? Yep. Yeah. Because if it's well organized, with strong interest, one goal, it's much easier. So what it could be was free import, no tariffs on Italian Maseratis, could that be one? I think the group would be rather small. The goal would be very easy, free, no tariff Maseratis. Well organized, um, probably they will all be 23 years old. They all study in Molde, and they're all looking forward to have their own Maserati. Then it could be a success. But most of the, let's say, problems are linked to, it's not well organized, and it's not a clear target for the organization. And if somebody asks you in the street when they buy the next copy of your lecture notes, Krugman is very clear to this. It's a negative form of policy. It's not a gain for a country. It might be a gain for US, but there are very few countries where this is a gain. Okay? So, if you look into uh, the political economy of trade, three clear answers would be there. Then, there is no reason to regulate trade, because trade is beneficial for all countries involved. So when they regulate trade, it's simply because they have two domestic problems. So this is the easiest way out of domestic problems. And they let trade be hurt. A bad solution. Two, the reason why they can do this is simply because there are so strong interests, let's say in agriculture, that you can form a very strong, well organized group to establish trade uh, restriction. And three, even if there is social benefit, that are the few and rare exceptions that trade regulations can be uh, against. But there are not so many areas where there are marginal net social benefits, period. Okay? So if you ask me, this could be a Deutsche War. So the more you produce of them, this is Deutsche War in France. This is Deutsche War in the rest of the world, because it's less than in France. It would be cheaper to produce it. 
so-called sitwa, this would be a gain. Probably for those who buy them too. Because what is the advantage of a Deutsche War is, one, it is a car, two, it has an engine, three, it's faster than the bicycle. Well, if it's windy, it's downhill and then can might compete, but yeah. it is, l let's say, covered. So if you use it in rain, you do not get wet. And if you want to go to the nearest shop, you can drive there and drive home safely. So it has some advantages. It is a car. It can be cheap. So it's a marginal social benefit. Those who would have used a bicycle to go to the shop would have been wet, got sick, wouldn't have needed the food. But with the dirty war, they are safe. So there might be marginal social benefits. But I think none of you have ever driven a dirty war. Never. Have you seen one? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Uh, if you think this, okay. If you think this is the most lousy car in the world, the answer is no. Cross over to UK. Buy yourself a Morris. They had it in wooden plates. I mean, there are no Dusha War with wooden plates, are there? No. So there are even worse cases. So don't be wor don't worry. Be happy. There are worse cases than Dusha War. Okay. But obviously, if this reduces the cost of production, it is a gain for those who use it. Simply because they need a car, this is the only one they can afford, and that is a benefit for, for they, let's say, they don't get sick, they need no health care, they can get their food, they are not starving, things like that. So it's a social benefit. That is the last example of Deutsche Woe from now on, okay? Now we shift to Morris Mini with wooden plates. Okay. What do you know about free trade areas? Have you ever been a member of one? No? You were a member of EEC. What is the difference between a FTA and an EEC. Not very big. The name? The name? Yeah. Could there be other differences? In South America, they call it. Yes. So that is a free trade area in South America because it's a trade area in the South. That sounds a little bit more let's say, fascinating than EEC. What was EEC? The European Economic Community. In fact, it was a kind of free trade area. We do not call it free trade area, but it is. Now, we have a NAFTA. which is not the first NAFTA, but the second. It's a free trade area between two countries. In the first version, because it was between New Zealand and, and Australia. The second one is a three-member NAFTA, because it's Canada, US, and Mexico. And they are not trading drugs at least not legally. But if you want to get very rich in Mexico, don't worry about free trade. Okay. So that is a free trade area. What are the differences between EEC, NAFTA, and EU? Yes. So in addition to free trade, they also have common policy. So if you think about integration, the least integrated you are is with a free trade area. Then you can trade free. Not every good, but some good. That is the least. Then you integrate the economies because it's easier to trade. Okay? 
European Union simply means you have also common policy. So that is a deeper uh, integration. Okay. You all know what a round is. First round, second round. A round is simply a discussion that you have when you try to come up with free trade agreement. Okay? Where is Uruguay? Yeah? Neighbor of yeah? Paraguay, isn't it? Yeah. But not Chile. No. Why did they have a round of free trade discussions in Uruguay? It's simply because it's in the developing world. Because Argentina, Chile, maybe not Brazil, uh, but at once at that time, was a developing country. So they had strong interest in free trade. So they had the strongest interest. So it's better to meet at home in Uruguay. They're all around have interest for this. Okay? Uruguay and Doha has one thing in common. None of them are in developed countries, but in developing countries. What are the differences between a developed country and a developing country? Is that one has developed, the other one is developing just now. So it's, let's say, trying to be more economic, efficient, more Okay? Why did they discuss agriculture products in Doha is that mainly all exports from developing countries has been agriculture products. Coffee from Brazil, bananas from orange from Algeria, figs from somewhere in Africa. So all of the exports from most of the de developing country has been agriculture. So far, so good. Agriculture. Why is not China happy for the Doha? Solution. Why are China opposing agriculture free trade? Okay. So none of you have read all of chapter 10. It's here by <laughs> most you all. Because if you look up one of the tables in chapter 10, I think it's 10.3 or 10.4. One day you probably will. Okay. Then you will see the only country that is losing for a, uh, from a Doha solution for agriculture trade is China. The one and only. So there are 149 or 211 other countries that would gain from it. But there is one country losing from it. What are the differences between Seychelles and China? Okay. Um, if you say, what are the differences between um, Zimbabwe and China when it comes to trade? China is the second largest economy in the world. It means that it's probably the second largest importer and exporter in the world. What about Zimbabwe? I think if you look at the bottom of the list, you will see Zambia, 
Oh, yeah, there it is, Zimbabwe too. So it's not a very important country. But China is. In fact, hadn't it been for China, somebody would say, US would have gone almost bankrupt. Because they wouldn't have the money they need to run US. Because they can get it from China. Why do they get it from China? Simply because they have a surplus of the trade balance. They earn more by export than they import. So they have a lot of money in their banks. So they lend it to US and US over. So since China is the second largest countries, uh, economy of countries in the world, when they say no, it's hard to come up to an agreement. So therefore, the Doha <coughs> disappointment is simply because this would gain or be beneficial for the developing world. Maybe this could have been the most important policy change for the developing world. Why don't they do it? Because the Chinese don't like it. They will lose from it. They have strong interest in opposing it. And therefore, there was no agreement. Are China the only one with strong interest in agriculture? And then I look at the EU and I say, what about EU? More than 40% of the EU budget goes to agriculture sector. Almost half of it. So for every euro you pay to the EU, 50 cents of it ends up in agriculture, or 42. So that is the biggest subsidized sector in the EU. Why do you do it? You will have a week to think it over. Is that a fair deal? So I'll ask you next week. But China, as well as the EU, have very strong interest in subsidizing agriculture. Maybe it's because you are very fond of wine, of cheese, of tomatoes, of grapes, or whatever food you eat. But this is the strongest subsidized uh, industry probably in all Europe. You outrun us, everybody. Not even Norway can compete with you. You are the strongest. And we don't think you are doped, even though Austria is member, and we know that skiers from Austria try to do something with the ability, and we call it doping. So, are this the only, uh, let's say, agriculture? Because we can think of clothing as based upon cotton, and then it's agriculture. But clothing in US is just the same. Why do they subsidize clothing in the US? When they can get it much cheaper from China. Yes. What has happened to American clothing industry is, okay, would you look at Paul Blackford with very wide open eyes, and then you see there are four legs here, there is a small part there, and this looks like doesn't it? You see, there are the four lakes. This is Florida, this is Mexico, out there is in Hawaii, and up there is the cold place, yeah, or Canada. Clothing industry in US used to be on the East Coast. Where is it now? At least moved in this direction. For those of you who are very fond of reading Krugman, you should read Krugman because he has given the proof of why did it shift from here 
to here is a because of a marriage percent. Do you know what a marriage is? For two persons join together and promise to live together and in US they will be male and female and they celebrate it and they get a present. Okay? I think it was in the 60s or maybe 70s somebody gave a bed cloth. Do you know what it is? I don't think you have it in your accommodation. I have at home, but not in the bed I sleep in normally. It is when you cover the bed clothes with a big, nice thing called a bed cloth. So you probably have seen it when you go to your palace in Provence, have you? But you don't have any palace in Provence. But if you had had one, you would have had bed clothes. Okay, this was produced somewhere here became so popular so the industry shifted from no, no, south no, north east to south west why do it shift is simply because of an accident somebody got married wanted a present and what did they get something made out of cloth so very often changes like this could be pure accidental there is no historical reason why it should move from here to here. So that is what we call accidental. Bad for the east, lucky for the southwest. So very often there are changing domestically here. Why didn't they protest against the movement here? Why didn't the, the say, politicians of northeast of U.S. rally in the streets of Washington and say, we want our clothes industry back. We want our clothes industry back. Why didn't they do it? It's still at home. It's in the U.S. It's in the U.S. Much easier than that. The number of politicians living in the southwest are larger than the number of politicians supporting it here. So they could rally for a week. The majority would say, No, it's ours. We got it. You lost it. So it's like a football game. It was an offside goal. The referee accepted it. It was it. So it's very simply like this. It's domestic. It's hard to stop. There are no strong interests to stop it. But if this had been China, you can introduce a tariff. So the Chinese version would have been too expensive. So we wouldn't have imported it. So it's easier when it comes to crossing borders. Then it's us against them. And you should have seen British football supporters in Paris if they lose at a penalty shootout in the European Championship in two years' time from now on. They would have gone mad because it's them against us. But here, it's internal. It's domestic. It's hard to stop. But there are changes. will be in the future and it won't be stopped because it has nothing to do with trade. Okay. So far, so good. So, we have free trade areas. We have negotiation to try to make trade freer. But there are no strong rallies domestically asking for more free trade. I think there are not too many slides left. So if none of you have an appointment now outside, should we run through the roster without a break?
Let's test it out how it works. The first one who fell asleep, I'll throw a, a liter of water again. Okay, so you wake up. <coughs> Norway has supported agricultural production for 40 years. It started when we discovered that there are oil and gas resources off the coast of Norway. With these oil and gas resources that we could extract, we earned a lot of money. And we decided to spend some of that money on agriculture subsidies. I cannot promise that this will last forever. The reason why we did it is we want to take care of our rural areas. What can you do in rural areas in Norway? Yeah, fishing and produce food. Those who are not hiking, eat. Those who hike, eat. Those who ski, eat. So you need food production. So in Norway we have had food production subsidy. Is it right to do so? There is only one Norwegian boy and one Norwegian girl left. So we will have a meeting on Monday morning where we will discuss and come up with a conclusion. But yes, we do it. We think it's good because we, let's say, uh, and can use all available resources, even up north where there's snow in the winter, fish in the spring, and food in the summer. So that is one. Why do we protect labor-intensive production like clothing? Why is it so easy for politicians to protect labor-intensive production? Because this guy or girl, I, I think in US they say guy even if it's a girl. Okay. He is also a voter. If this is the marginal voter that decides that you will be or not be in politics, so it's much easier to see the politician who would benefit from this labor working. Okay. Two. Why are we so keen interest in supporting this with a very simple technology? They can do it in Bangladesh. All they need is a sewing machine and some clothes and they can make it there. Why is it so important that they do it here? It's not spending much capital behind it. Why do a country like US, which has access to a lot of capital, why do they protect these so less capital intensive industry like this? It's low wage. It's not very high wage labors in this. It is the area of the developing country has the strongest comparative advantage. So if I had told Ricardo this 200 years ago, that this would be the policy of US, they will subsidize the industry where their foreign has the strongest comparative advantage. He would never have rested in his grave. So if you had been near where Ricardo is buried, you would hear the sound all the way. Because he's moving around and around and around. Because this is the worst example, according to Ricardo, where you try to reduce trade. So it's like a fan uh, in an air condition. Okay? So think of this as the air-conditioned fan. It's Ricardo moving around and around because this is the area 
where the benefit of faith is so visible, it's so obvious that you gain from faith. So why on earth do they not allow free trade? And I'm afraid you have to be an American senator to answer the question. I cannot do it because I'm not in the American Senate. Okay? So this is the area where trade regulation has the worst effects of all. And this is what they put their politics into. You know what a war is. But do you know what a trade war is? That's when two countries try to fight each other to avoid trade with each other. The hard problem today is, do you know what prisoner's dilemma is? No. Have you been to US? Have you tried to rob a bank? Do it with a friend, then you realize what prisoner problem is. It's simply like this. There are two suspects. Both would gain from not confessing. Okay? But it's easy to see that one of them will get, let's say, lower sentence or reduced sentence if he confesses. Would you then confess? Are you sure? And you know that the friend of yours, which is not a friend, in the neighboring cell will soon confess? Okay, so <laughs> your problem will then be 15 years in jail instead of no jail at all. Because if both denies, they have no confession, they cannot con <coughs> a sentence you. That's a very hard life. The prisoner's dilemma is like this. Everyone could see that the right thing is to do what you plan to do, not confess. But both of them gain by confessing. And they end up with the worst solution for all. But that is the problem. Prisoner's dilemma is showing the problem of a trade war. Both would be better off with no war. But both will gain from a trade war. But since both are uh, performing a trade war, both will lose most of all. So we call it a prisoner dilemma simply because it's American uh, law, uh, how the American law works. Because if you have no proof, then if some confess, they get reduced sentence. So don't go to US to try to rob the bank. You probably be, will be expelled to France, so that's no problem at all. And when you come back to France, you say, he's lying. He was doing it. I was not there. I was here. Yeah. So prisoner's dilemma is simply showing that trade war is the best, the diverse solution for both of them. But since all the incentives will end, it will end up with the worst solution instead of the best. So you have to regulate it. And then you have international negotiations. So by international agreements, rounds, trade, uh, free trade agreements, you can guarantee free trade. But because of prisoners' dilemma, they will end up with a worse solution. So therefore, we look for international negotiations. They can guarantee free trade or freer trade. And that is beneficial to all of us. And I still say, if you turn the pages back, you can end up with ESO value line. And then you see free trade is the best solution. Okay. Then I got a message to say, speed up, because they want to go back to the city center. OK. Do you know what OECD is? But it was what called OEC, and now it's called OECD, which means Organization of European Cooperation and Development. It was formed just after the Second World War, and the idea was to develop Europe. 
So that is one of the international organizations that is trying to improve the condition for trade. Do you know what GATT is? And what is the link to WTO? This was a general agreement on trade and tariffs. It has to do with the way you organize trade. General agreement on trade and tariffs. Simply means more trade, less tariffs. What is WTO? Is an organization try to improve the conditions for trade. So these are international organizations and agreements that has tried to improve conditions for trade. This is what we call a trade round, where you try on individual basis in individual countries to come up with solutions on special export or import of goods. Agriculture is one. Have they been successful? Yeah, I think so. Had it been too uh, beneficial to Brazil? Could have been. Maybe because of domestic problems? But obviously, it must have been to a certain. Uh, I think it is Brasek, isn't it? When all of the countries are there. B. Is it Brazil? R. Is Russia? See, Russia. Brazil, Russia, India, South Africa, and. Yeah. It's. Brazil, Russia, India, South Africa. And. <laughs> so you wanted a brick, okay? Yeah. Do you know the song "Yellow Brick Stove"? Yeah. Oh, so this is bricks, okay? We end up at least with Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. What has been the success of these countries is free trade. Do you know what happened in China in 1949? There was a revolution. Still, China was very poor. China became important in the 90s. What happened in South Africa in 1994? They chose a different president. The apartheid regime was thrown out. Before 1994, there were trade restrictions in South Africa. Afterwards, they developed. Okay. What was the name of Russia in 1989? USSR. Back in USSR. Midfielder in USSR. It was the Union of so Socialist Soviet Republics. Now it's Russia. So they split up. Okay. Brazil, Arturo and Guilherme will have a night with slideshows of Brazil in 1962, 1972, 1982. And they won the World Cup not in Rio in 1954, no, in Rio they lost the first one. I think it was 1950, wasn't it? No, in 62 it was in Uruguay. 
So this is the second time it is down there. So Brazil will be a slideshow evening meeting with Guyan and there will be free water for all of you, but you will know more about Brazil. But all of these developed in the 90s and 2000s because of Rio Trade. The problem is collective action. There are no strong supporters of free trade. So they, uh, the happenings in Uruguay simply was impossible because there were no strong interest at home. As we said, the Doha disappointment is the distance between China, India and US and China would lose. Probably there will be more free trade. Probably there will be more custom unions. Probably because we trade more. But the reason why we have unions is simply we trade more with our neighbors. So EU was between neighbors. We trade with countries with similar industry structure. So if we trade, we trade with Sweden or Denmark, United Kingdom or Germany, they have more or less similar structure of industry as we do. We do not trade a lot with Brazil. We do not trade a lot with China. We trade more with Japan, I think, than with China. But they are too far away. And with a different industry structure, we don't trade with them. So if you wonder, when you come back home and will be state of, uh, let's say, political secretary to the French Minister of Trade and International Relations, the first thing you should do is support his idea of closer contacts and links with Spain when one of the other ministers have launched a closer link to Vietnam. Not because it was a colony of France, but simply because he went there and was a nice place to go. But for trade, it must be similar industry structure as your. It must be close to you because you cannot transport this too long if it's not cars from Japan. And that is the major reason why we trade. Close, with a similar structure, because most of this is intra-industry trade. Okay? Since half of the group has left the room, I have decided that next time will chapter be chapter 11. I think chapter 12 could be okay. But I will let it be left up to you to decide. So after the slideshow with Artur and Gijan, you run quickly through the last chapters. And you cross for how many lectures are left? Seven? Eight, I think. Eight lectures. So you pick eight chapters till next time. Is that a fair deal? Eight, five plus three, till next week. Does that sound okay? So you will be allowed to pick eight chapters. And then we meet here and we vote for chapter by chapter. And if you have very strong interest in, in chapter 19 or two, then you have to form a rally with a banner and say, I won't end this course if I do not have chapter 19. Is that a fair deal? So if there is one chapter you love to run through, pick it. But that means that since you are three, six, eight left, we could make a fair deal now. Those who stick to the end of the courses will pick each 
one, one chapter. So you will have one choice of your own. Is that a fair deal? I mean, the other left, they lost their opportunity to influence the solution. So what we say next Wednesday, each of you meet with a banner with the chapter you want. And if one of you have the same as one of the others, there is one left for the other. Okay? So if all of you end up with one chapter, there are seven chapters left. If you end up with four, it's four left. So if I look around, I think two chapters might be common for two of you. That leaves two chapters for the others to choose. Okay? One big piece of paper, stick to a stick, with the number of chapters. You can read, for instance, 19. We need not say chapter, but 19. Is that a fair deal? One for each. And do not meet in secrecy to decide that chapter 17 will be dropped out. I will one way or the other find out how to get chapter 8 into the lesson. Okay, fair deal. Have a nice weekend. See you next week when it will be snowing, windy, and you will stay indoors. Yes, there are. You're welcome.